this 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 is what we're going to talk about the right flyer the right military flyer yes Walk me through this. I can't believe we get to just... Well, this is one of my favorite objects. And again, you know, as a conservator, it's all original. So this is from oh. 1909. And basically, you know, the, the Wright brothers had invented flight. Right. But then they had to find a good market for it. Who's going right. to buy these crazy things? And who better than the military? If and I remember, the military was a little bit reluctant at first, or at least didn't return their calls as quickly as one would expect. Well, yeah, and, and you know, things like early technologies like this, even for the military, they're sort of wondering, you know, how could this even be used? Um, and so that's why this went into the Signal Corps, because at the early gotcha. times, you're not going up there with the weaponry or anything like that. This was used for uh, signaling. Uh, you know, locations of the enemy, things like that. Yeah. But um, the, the military set out a, a set uh, specified number of requirements. So who's ever going to provide this aircraft has got to be able to fly a certain distance, got to be able to stay up for a certain amount of time. It's got to fly at a certain speed. And so... Um, have a certain payload. A, a certain weight okay. that they had to carry. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in uh, 1908, they provided it an airplane and were doing some of the test trial runs and that airplane crashed. So one of the propellers split, it uh, tore out some of the bracing wires and Orville and Lieutenant Selfridge kind of nosedived into the ground, killing Lieutenant Selfridge. Right. right. And so uh, a number of months later, they went back and actually made this airplane, which is a slightly different configuration and came back and won the trial. So oh. where current uh, Arlington National Cemetery is, where they were doing those trials, and they flew out over Arlington and, and passed the test. And these are pieces that were literally put together by the brothers. Yes, yep. Um, and it has the same fundamentals as the original 1903 flyer, so it yep. has wing warping control. Um, the engine is, is, a, is a, a major upgrade from what they had in 1903. Back then they had a horizontal four-cylinder with just evaporative carburation. Yeah. This, I see, this is a radiator. This is a gigantic radiator. Oh, yep. I never noticed that before. Yeah. So it, it was liquid cooled. Yep. That's crazy. Yep. And also fuel injected. No. So if you look on the side of the engine, yeah. I've, I actually have the, the fuel pump off at this time. We're cleaning it up. But back there, it has a, a circulating oil pump. So there's oh. a pressurized oil system throughout the engine. Oh. This is, you know, this is 1908 technology. And this is their invention. The right the, this, design they, they designed and created these engines themselves oh. and went into production afterwards. I mean, they made right. uh, you know, quite a number of these engines. Um, but, but yeah, so it, it, it took fuel from the large fuel tank that was mounted right up here, right. pressurized it, and sprayed it directly into the intake manifold. So technically, I guess it's, you know, fuel the first injection. fuel injected engine. Do I see this as lead, lead foil? Uh, this is just, yeah, a uh, tin plate. And oh, okay. This, and because early engines like this were throwing oil everywhere. The, right, the right. seal technology was practically non-existent. And so instead of having the oil dripping and flowing onto the fabric and yeah. causing a fire concern, this collected it and drained it down through the bottom of the wing. So how did <clears throat> like the use of the pilot goes here? The pilot and co-pilot? Pilot and co-pilot. And, and unfortunately, so we have the airplane sitting on the stand because we're actually getting ready to ship it downtown to put it back on display. Okay. Okay. So a lot of these components are removed right yeah. now, but the pilot would sit here, co-pilot sat, sat here. Uh, the controls would be right out here on a, on a separate rig. And then right from here was a whole superstructure that went out and, and supported the, uh, the forward canard. So gotcha. it was a double wing control right, right. that provided the, the pitch control out front. Wow. I just the mo I keep thinking the brothers built this and right like when my grandmother was nine years old, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And it was in service down in Texas for a couple of years. I mean, it, was it really? They flew this thing constantly. There were constant. You know, we we have the log books, so we know how many times they they wiped it out and you know damaged <laughs> the wingtips. Oh and, wow! And they, and they did modifications under the guidance of Orville Wright back in Dayton. So and they, then you can find the repairs that the documentation covers. All of oh, that stuff oh, is amazing. Is, so we basically know just about every single damage that's on this thing. And you can see it in the historic photographs. It's recorded in the logbook. And that, that's a great thing about having something that's never been restored, right. is that it's truly, I mean, it, it tells us, 
it supports the, the you know the written documentation. That's crazy. Can and we, it's, and it just has this look about it that no, it's just so no. alluring. And before we go, I mean, if you notice, bicycle chain. Look, I love the, the bicycle chains going through the pipes yep. to keep them from catching through us. the guides. Stuff. Absolutely. So yeah, you know, a lot of the things that they developed when they were building their own bicycles is transferred into the construction techniques on their aircraft. Well, and I know that it seems like it may seem to you that it's weirdly primitive to use bicycle chains, but to be honest, from a power transfer ratio, they were dead on the money yes. for a lightweight yep. transfer system. Super efficient. Absolutely. And, and if you think about, you know, an engine like this, it has a big dead weight flywheel, right. but it also needs the mass of the chains to sort of keep, I mean, when this thing's running, you know, the propellers, I mean, there's a lot of jarring and shaking. Right, and so right. any amount of mass that is also supporting the sort of buffering of the engine oh, and, the, and the pulsing that you get from that, it helps sort of dampen the, um, whole system. the whole system and make it uh, last a bit longer. I keep forgetting that these planes are like entirely carefully tuned systems where every part is working with every other part. Yes. And this whole thing, I mean, it's like an organic machine. I, right. I mean, the, you know, the notion of wing warping, if you look at the controls, see there's a little chain and sprocket yeah, yeah, down there. Yeah. Those cables oh, go up, they pull down the trailing edge. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then the other sprockets at the top pull up the trailing edge. And so the whole structure is, you know, carefully banking to the left and to the right. And unfortunately, you know, the, the, the limit to that technology is that it only works at really slow speeds. Once right. you start getting right. into the higher speeds, this kind of design just does, it's not going to hold up structurally or performance wise. But I had never, I've been, I, you know, I grew up so in, uh, imbued with ailerons that I didn't realize that the main structure of the plane ends here. And that this is just control that's, circuits. That's all, that's all movable. Exactly. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> this is what's going on the whole time. Oh my God. If we go down to the wingtip yeah. here, you'll see some of these damages. I mean, I love things like this where, where there's still hand oils from the ground crew because you, <laughs> you know, oh, yes. they would have to land, yes. they put it up on a little wheel dolly, get it back to, to the base. And so a lot of this handling stuff is still embedded in the fabric, but all these damages and tears, all of this stuff is part of its operational history. So some people ask, well, why don't you just recover or why don't you cover up all these, you know, patches? It's like, Look this is, that. we have record, yeah, and yeah. So every little stitch hole has been reinforced with a bit of dope oh. so that it doesn't tear through this very oh thin muslin fabric. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, whoa. And, every, and everybody that made a repair obviously had, a, had their own unique technique. Oh yeah, right, you know, of course. Because at, you know, at this time there were no FAA directives on how to do a proper tear right. repair. Wow. And this tear here, yeah. <clears throat> this happened while it was in the museum's care. Not sure what happened, but when we pull back this flap of fabric, there's pencil writing indicating where this section of fabric goes on the airframe. So wow. it could have been could have been the Wright brothers who wrote right, it, right. who knows, but little details like that are wonderful. This is where the propellers mount. Yep. Very simple. And their they were designing and building their own propellers. They were the first to realize that they were truly a wing. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, and, and, and incredibly efficient. So, yeah. so I mean, the, the, that's really the genius of the Wright brothers was, was pairing up the horsepower of the engine for the size of the craft and mating it up with, with the propellers of the right dimensions and, and propulsion. And I mean, it's, it's this, symphony of all these variables that came together to make this such a successful airplane. Their wind tunnel. At some point, I just want to replicate their wind tunnel yeah. because it's so remarkable that they were able to come to all of this balance of measurements using yes. their own testing equipment. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, but this is the, uh, the Bosch Magneto oh, that yeah. provided the ignition. Yeah. yeah. Um, the engine originally had make and break ignition in 08. And actually that is the exact same engine that was part of the 1908 crash. Oh, wow. That killed Selfridge. And Selfridge was killed not only by the impact with the ground, but the engine landed on top of oh, him. So crazy. that engine was part of that crash. And they repurposed it for the, uh, for the next uh, test run in 1909, wow. but they upgraded to the, to the Magneto. Which you, which you see here, which is you know just perfectly preserved. Oh this is all beautiful vulcanite. Here's, here's the intake manifold, yeah. and it's just a simple assembly. And, and you know one of the one of the, the issues with any sort of intake manifold is getting the distribution of the fuel air mixture evenly distributed through right. the port. So right. inside it has its own little baffles Ooh. that are soldered into place. One pictures them using all their bicycle knowledge to do these beautiful lugs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, and brazing techniques too. Yeah, I mean, all yeah. those skills. This is the fuel pump, 
It's just a simple no. spur gear setup. We've driven off the uh, the camshaft, and and here's the uh, the port. So it basically picked up fuel from the uh, wow. the tank. This is a little fuel strainer that would feed <laughs> into it, and then here's the nozzle. That's the little spray nozzle at the tip that goes right into. Here's the fitting. So it goes through this hole. No way. And this is the fitting that goes onto here. And that's and the fuel injector. And it just sprays sprays vaporized fuel as it comes out into the intake manifold. Incredible. The original spark plugs are here. <laughs> um, we're even saving the original fuel line. Oh, so it, it had a number of brakes in it. We're, we're making repairs there using a synthetic resin called Biva, mm -hmm. which is basically a totally inert uh, uh, type of plasticky kind of uh, adhesive. Wow. Now this is the side cover panel with the original gaskets. All the stuff will go back on <sighs> as it is. What magic. <laughs> so every little bit, every little screw gets cleaned up, but we yeah. don't want to, we don't want it to look new again. We yep. just basically need to knock off any kind of signs of oxidation or right, active deterioration right, right. and then apply uh, inhibiting coatings. Oh my God, Malcolm, this is just, what a thrill, what a thrill. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely.